Hey there folks, welcome back for part three of this music theory for banjo player series. Today, we're gonna talk about major and minor scales. And first off, let's just talk about what a scale actually is. Remember that we have 12 notes that we use in Western music, but we're not gonna use all 12 notes all the time. You've probably already played some music and realized that you play a lot of the same notes over and over again in the same piece of music. Well, a scale is a collection of notes that we build chords from, that we build melodies from, and that we use to improvise so that those notes all feel connected. One thing you've probably noticed is that when you play a song in a certain key, there are certain notes that sound like they don't fit. Well, those notes are outside of the key or outside of the scale, so they're not really related to what's going on in the song. And hopefully this clears things up a little bit for people because some people have somewhat of an understanding of what a key is, chords that fit together and notes that fit together, and then there's this separate idea of a scale, like you use a scale to play certain kinds of music or improvise in a certain way. And that can be true, but a lot of the time, scale and key are kind of synonymous. When you think about songs that you play where it has a certain set of chords that all seem to fit together, well, every note in those chords comes from the same scale. And most melodies, like for instance in fiddle tunes, all come from one scale at a time anyway. So a tune that's in the key of D major just uses all notes from the D major scale, or a tune that's in E minor uses notes from the E minor scale. That's not always true, and again, is kind of an oversimplification, but for the most part, scale and key are kind of synonymous. So then let's just dive in and talk about how you know which notes are in each scale. We already know that all of these scales are gonna contain some of the 12 notes that we've gone over in the previous lesson, but we need some sort of formula to figure out how to build a major scale or a minor scale. So let's first talk about how we talk about the distance between some of these notes. And the most common way that we do that is with half steps and whole steps. And this is pretty simple. A half step is the distance between any two notes that are adjacent to each other in these 12 notes. That would be like going from A to B flat, or from B to C, any of these two notes that are right next to each other in this line. If you skip a note, that's a whole step, like from A to B, or from B to C sharp. And this is pretty easy to visualize on the banjo as well, because as we already know, each fret corresponds with one of the 12 notes. So the distance between any two frets that are next to each other is a half step. If you skip a fret, that's a whole step. Why is this important? Well, the major scale and the minor scale are both made up of different combinations of half steps and whole steps. And it's the same for any major scale or minor scale. There's just one major scale formula and one minor scale formula. And when it comes to major scales, it's pretty easy. It's just whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. That means no matter where you start, no matter what note you start on, if you have a whole step followed by a whole step, then a half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, and one more half step, then the notes that you get will be a major scale. Now, here's an example of that. If we started on C, and then we looked at our line of all of the notes, and we just went and applied this system, this whole step and half step formula, then here's what we'd end up with. One whole step above C would be D, one whole step above D would be E, a half step above E would be F, a whole step above F would be G, a whole step above G would be A, a whole step above A would be B, and then a half step above B would bring us back to C. Now don't worry, I'm gonna talk about actually playing this on the banjo, different scale patterns and shapes, but for now let's keep just thinking about what the notes are in the scales. Hey folks, I'm just gonna interrupt real quick to let you know that if you want PDF files for everything in this lesson and all of my lessons, you can get that at patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo, which is where you can also get backup examples, practice tips, all kinds of stuff that you can't find here on YouTube. Also, it's a really great way to support the work that I'm doing here. But if that's not for you, just subscribe to this channel and like this video. That's another huge thing you could do to help me make more of these videos. So if you do that, I really appreciate it. Anyway, back to the lesson. And let's try another one of those because that was kind of easy. It's just the letter names, no sharps or flats. Let's do something like D, the D major scale. And we're gonna do it exactly the same way, starting on D and then whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. So if we start on D, then one whole step above that would be E. A whole step above that would be F sharp and a half step above that would be G. A whole step above that would be A. A whole step above that would be B. A whole step above that would be C sharp, 
and then a half step above that would bring us back to D. That's our D major scale. Now, you might be wondering, why did I choose to use F sharp and C sharp instead of G flat and D flat? Well, there's actually a pretty simple explanation, and it makes things a lot easier to understand in terms of which notes are in each scale. We want to make sure that each major scale and minor scale contains each of the letter names. We don't want to repeat any, and we don't want to skip any. So when I get to F sharp, if I were to use G flat instead, then I would be skipping F and repeating G because the next note after G flat would be G. So we want to make sure that we have each of the letter names represented so there's no risk of confusing them by saying G flat and G and accidentally using one or the other. It's not really something you think about while you're playing, but in terms of communicating things or writing them down, it can be a lot easier. But before we bring that to the banjo for some more practical information, let's also talk about minor scales, which are similar but obviously different. What's similar about them is that you use a formula of half steps and whole steps to find out what the notes are in that scale. What's different is the way that they sound. And the formula for a minor scale is whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole, whole. So then let's just compare and contrast. We've looked at the C major scale. Let's now look at the C minor scale. If we follow this formula for the minor scale, then we'll start with C. One whole step above that is D. One half step above that is E flat. Whole step above that would be F. Another whole step above that would be G. A half step above G would be A flat. A whole step above that would be B flat. And a whole step above that would be C. And again, we used E flat, A flat, and B flat instead of D sharp, G sharp, and A sharp because it gave us the continuity of having each letter in the scale. Now, just for the sake of experience, let's look at another minor scale, the A minor scale. And we're gonna follow the same formula. So starting from A, we're gonna go up one whole step to B another half step to C, a whole step to D, a whole step to E, a half step to F, a whole step to G, and then finally a whole step back to A. That's our A minor scale. But now there's something kind of interesting going on here. Take a look at our C major scale and our A minor scale. They're starting on different notes, sure, but it's all the same notes and they're in the same order, just starting in different places. And this is kind of a big deal. This is something you're really gonna wanna understand, is that major scales and minor scales are intrinsically connected. In fact, each major scale is actually the same as another minor scale and vice versa. Now, depending on context and what order you put chords and notes and melodies in, they're gonna sound very, very different, but they contain the same notes. C major and A minor contain the same notes. And in music theory terms, we would say that A minor is the relative minor of C major. Basically, if you figure out what notes are in a major scale, then you know all the notes in another minor scale. And as long as you know how those two scales are connected, it's gonna be pretty easy to figure that out. But how are they connected? Well, let's just take a look at our C major and A minor. They're all the same notes starting in different places. So maybe we need to look at the relationship between the first note in each scale, C and A. So starting from the note C, how do we get to A? Well, we can think about A as being the sixth note in a C major scale. So you can think about the relative minor, meaning the minor scale with all the same notes, as starting on the sixth note of your major scale. And just for good measure, let's look at another scale, one that we're gonna use all the time as bluegrass banjo players, G major. If we start from G and we go up one whole step, we'll get A. Up another whole step is B. Up a half step would be C. Up a whole step is D. Up another whole step is E. Up one more whole step is F sharp, and then a half step back to G. That's our G major scale. And if we want to know what the relative minor of the G major scale is, we just have to look for the sixth note. So G, A, B, C, D, E. E is the relative minor of G major, so the E minor scale and the G major scale have all the same notes. Okay, so that's a lot of information, and so far, not that much of it on the banjo. But let's change that now and take some of these scales and learn how to play them. But first, let's go back to that idea of half steps and whole steps and see how that fits on the banjo. If you remember any two frets right next to each other, like this G and A flat, that's a half step. A whole step is if you just skip a fret, like from G, to A. So you can think about that line of 12 notes 
as existing on the fretboard, just like we talked about in the last lesson in this series. So just given that information and the understanding of these formulas for major scales and minor scales, you can actually figure out all the notes in a certain scale on one string just by following the whole step half step formula. So let's just try that now with, for instance, the G major scale. Let's start on the open third string, which is G. And we're just gonna count our way back up to G using that formula. So from G, up a whole step or two frets to A, up a whole step to B, up a whole step to C, up a whole step to D, up another whole step to E, up another whole step to F sharp, and then up a half step brings us back to G. So that's our entire G major scale on one string. And as you do that, I think it's a really good idea to just start naming the notes as you play them. G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. If you're willing to do that whenever you learn a new scale or figure something out, then you're just gonna have a better idea of where those notes are. If I play G often enough on the third string, I'm gonna know that that's G. You probably already know just from experience that the third string is G. Well, if you keep doing this with all these other frets as you play them, you're gonna get really comfortable with other notes as well. You're just gonna know that the second fret on the third string is A because you've played it a million times and you've thought of it as A a million times. And obviously we can do the same thing with minor scales. We did G major, so we might as well just do G minor. Obviously we're gonna start on G again and we're just gonna follow the formula for a minor scale. So from G, up a whole step to A, up a half step to B flat, up a whole step to C, up a whole step to D, up a half step to E flat, up a whole step to F, and then up another whole step to G. That's our G minor scale. G, A, B flat, C, D, E flat, F, and G. Now, an important thing to think about with these scales, specifically on the banjo or any stringed instrument, is that you don't have to start on the first note of that scale necessarily, and that's not always how you're really gonna play music. You can play all the notes of the G major scale starting on any string, you just might not start from G. And that just requires that you not only know the formula for the scale, but also have some idea of what notes are already in the scale. So let's take G major for instance. We already know the G major is G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, and G. It's just all the letter names and you just make sure that F is F sharp. So it's not too much to remember. Well, if we wanna do that on any other string, like for instance, the first string, D, it's not that much harder than what we've already done. We just have to start from D and count our way up. So whether you're doing it with the formula or just the names of the notes and making sure that you skip the appropriate number of frets to make sure you hit the right note, you can do the same thing. So if you start from D and you know that you have to get to E, well, if you count your way through the 12 notes to E, it would be D, D sharp, E. Now you know the first two notes on that string would be D, E. And it would be the same thing going from E to F sharp. You would just start from E and count up to F and count up to F sharp. There you go. E to F sharp. Now we have D, E, F sharp. We know that F sharp is one half step away from G, so. And then you're on G, so you can do the rest of your formula as normal. G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. And it's really the same process no matter where you start. You can play the G major scale anywhere on the fretboard, starting from any note, starting from any string. It just kind of depends where you are in the formula. And you're gonna get more familiar with that the more you do it. And after a while, you start to get used to what the whole steps and half step pattern looks like. So you'll know that for instance, C to D here looks the same as C to D here and looks the same as C to D here. They're always gonna be the same on the same string. It's just two frets apart. So as far as this method goes, this is really just about exploring the fretboard, about counting your way between notes or following the formula, or just getting used to the pattern of whole steps and half steps. And as you do that, make sure you're naming the notes, even saying them out loud, and taking a mental note of where it is that those notes occur. Because after a while, you're just gonna start to remember certain notes fall in certain places. Like for some reason, I just know that's F sharp, and I just know that that's A. And it's just because I've done it a bunch of times. So that's all good information, and I hope that makes sense to you. But I wouldn't be surprised if at this point you're left with the feeling of, okay, what do I do next? 
because that's not really how we play music, just up and down one string at a time. You've probably seen people play all kinds of stuff using scales that looks really different from that. And here's the deal. We play the same scales, major and minor scales, but there's just a lot of different shapes and patterns that we can use to play them. So although this is just a music theory lesson, not exactly improvisation or technique, I might as well just show you a bunch of those patterns to get you started. So for the rest of this lesson, it's just gonna be kind of an onslaught of scale patterns and shapes, and you don't really have to learn all of them, especially not right now. If you're still working out the basics of Scrug style and just trying to get some technique up on the banjo, then this might actually not be the best place for you to go. Just understanding scales up and down on one string or just understanding scales in general is enough for right now, and go ahead and just build some more technique, learn some more tunes, play some more music. But if you're actually looking to learn scales or use them to improvise, then this is good material for you. Anyway, let's start with some patterns that fit all the way down here at the bottom of the neck. We're not going to move these patterns all the way across the neck. We're just going to think about these as existing here using some open strings and some fretted notes. We're going to start with these because it's close to where we actually play a lot of Scruggs material. So it's not necessarily that you're going to use these scales all the time to improvise, more so that it's going to give context to the stuff that you already play. And because of that, we're just going to look at things in the keys of G, C, and D for these patterns in particular. Because a lot of stuff that we play down here at this end of the neck tends to be in the keys of G, C, and D. And one last thing to note is that I'm going to play all of these scale patterns starting from the open D string going all the way up to the first string, even if that's not really the first note of the scale. We're just trying to have the full range of those scales on this part of the neck, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to start on G or start on C or start on D. It's more like all the notes in those scales in this position. And these patterns can be really helpful because they give some context to the music that you're playing in those keys and seeing where they fit within those scales. So if you think about anything you play in this area of the neck in the keys of G, C, or D, then it's a good chance that the melody notes and even the chords fit into these scale shapes. Now, don't forget all of those major scales have relative minor scales. So everything you just learned in those shapes are also three minor scales. The G major scale is also the E minor scale. The C major scale is also the A minor scale. And the D major scale is also the B minor scale. So you don't have to learn new patterns in that area for those scales. You just have to think about them in that context. It's all the same notes. You just have to think about them as either the major or minor version. Now that's a good start, but what about scales that are a little easier to move around the neck and play in other keys? For that, we're gonna wanna get into some more single string and melodic style playing, which I'll get into as we go. But let's start with another G major scale pattern, one that starts here on the fifth fret. As you can see, this pattern has all the same notes, it just starts on the fifth fret. And because it doesn't include any open strings, we can move this exact pattern anywhere on the fretboard to play in other keys. So instead of playing it here at the fifth fret to play a G major scale, we could play it up here at the 10th fret and play a C major scale. And we know that because the 10th fret here on the fourth string is C. With this pattern, as long as we know where the root note is, the first note in the scale, then we can move it anywhere and play anything. It also means that playing a G major scale is just as easy as playing an A flat major scale. G is here on the fifth fret. If we go up one half step to A flat and play the same pattern, that's an A flat major scale, which technically is as easy to play as G major. And we can do the same thing with minor scales. You can think of that pattern itself, G major, as an E minor scale pattern, because it is, but we can also do the same thing starting from E.
And this is also a pattern that you can just move around as long as you know what the root note is. So if this is E by a root note, if I move this pattern anywhere, like for instance to A, then I could play the A minor scale. Okay, so that's pretty cool. We can move that anywhere and play it in any key. But actually there's something kind of more interesting going on here. If we can play all the notes for G major in this position right here, but we can also play all the notes in G major in this position because G major and E minor are the same thing. Well, we can probably play all the notes of G major in just about any position. Actually, we can, I know we can. And that's really the far reaches of this single string stuff is just getting to understand how to play G major in any place across the neck. And there are a lot of patterns for doing this, but let's go over just a couple of them now. So this is G major or E minor, depending on how you look at it, all over the neck in every position. And there will be some continuity between each of the shapes. They'll have the same number of notes per string in each of the shapes, just in a different position. So they'll look a little different. So. As you play them, you're gonna to wanna to keep track of where G is because that can be kind of your touchstone for the position, but also just figure out where the notes are because if you get really comfortable with G major, then you're gonna know what a lot of these notes are across the entire neck. Okay, so that's a good start with that type of playing, but now let's get into melodic style, which is the same notes, just the major scale, but it's gonna sound pretty different. And if you're interested in learning more about melodic style, I do have another lesson about this, but I'll at least go over some of these shapes here now. Just like those first scale patterns that I showed you, these are all going to occur roughly in the same place, and they're not necessarily gonna start on the first note of each scale, but the patterns are going to include each note of the scale. And again, these are gonna be for the keys of G, C, and D. And of course, if you put a capo on, that'll change those keys. So for instance, if you were to put a capo on the second fret, it would move each of those up one whole step, Right, remember our half step, whole step math. So instead of G, C, and D, that would be A, D, and F sharp. So you're capable of using these patterns in many different keys, but with no capo, it's going to be G, C, and D. Thank you. 
So that is by no means an exhaustive list of all the different scale patterns that you can play. There are many, many more, which I hope to cover in future lessons, but that should be enough to get you started. And this isn't really a lesson specifically about improvisation, it's really just music theory, but you can already probably see how playing up and down these scales starts to almost feel like music. Well, if you want to dip your toe into the idea of improvisation, then try just playing them not straight up and down. That's as simple as improvising gets. This is just the scale. And what if you just played them in a different order or a different rhythm? That wasn't a tune, it wasn't even anything pre-planned, it was just all the notes of the scale in a different order. And I have experience with that, so it sounded kind of like music, but there's only one way to build experience with that in the beginning, and it's just to try things. Learn some of these scales and just play around with them for now. You can just use your ear and try to pick up some familiar melodies, or just try to play something that sounds nice using one scale. So that's gonna do it for this lesson. I hope you found that useful, and I hope you're looking forward to more lessons about music theory, but also technique and improvisation in the future. Those are definitely coming. But in the meantime, feel free to check out Patreon to support this channel or get more bonus banjo content, or just subscribe to this channel and like this video. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.